to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the apostle paul said i have been crucified with christ it's no longer i who live but Christ who lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. We welcome you today of our study of great Bible characters in that we think today about the Apostle Paul. Who, went, who is that man who went from Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor, to Paul, the apostle and preacher of the gospel. What a wonderful example Paul serves as a man who did a complete 180 degree turn in his life. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ worldwide. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lessons or any of our lessons, We'd love to send those to you free of charge. We'll even pay the postage to get them there. As always, you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, where we have a host of DVDs and CDs and video and audio lessons. You can order from our website. You can also contact us by email or find our phone number there as well. And if you've got a Bible question or maybe something that you're studying about or thinking about, We'd love to help you in any way that we can with those questions in your study of the Word of God. And we sure want to encourage you in your local area. Visit the Church of Christ. Let those people know that you'd like to learn more about the Lord's Church and God's plan of salvation. And they'd be more than happy to sit down and study with you. What do you know about Saul who changed his life and became the Apostle Paul? Saul of Tarsus was a man who was born in the city of Tarsus in the area of Cilicia. That was his hometown according to Acts chapter 9 verse number 11. Cilicia is a little bit north and a little bit east of what we think of as Israel today. And when we think about Saul, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Philippians 3 verse 5, he will refer to himself as a concerning uh, the nation of Israel, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Benjamite zealous for the law of God. And so he was of the chief stock of Israel, he would say, in the top rungs, you might say, of the people of Israel. And so he was a very proud Jew trying to follow the law of Israel and the traditions of the fathers who had been passed down. By trade, Saul was a tent maker. Acts chapter 18 verses 1 through 3, we learn that when Paul met up with Priscilla and Aquila because they were of the same trade, they were tent makers, they had some association naturally that way. And so he wasn't afraid to work. Hard work wasn't the issue. He worked on the side as well, but he always strove to put the kingdom first. He was, as he referred to himself, a Pharisee. Now a Pharisee, the word Pharisee literally means uh, separate. They were trying to live a separate life. They tried to be separate from the rest of Israel. They wanted to follow the, the, the law and the Mishnah, the traditions of Israel, to the strictest sense. And they sometimes as you'll see in the speaking of Jesus to the Pharisees, elevated their tradition right up there with the Word of God. But these were people who took their religion very seriously and who had a rich history in that. And so Paul said, a Pharisee of Pharisees, zeal for the law concerning righteousness. He wasn't afraid to be persecuted for those things. Saul had a great training in that law, even at the feet of the man known as Gamaliel. Acts chapter 22, verse 3, one of the great scribes and scholars of his day and age was the man Paul sat at the feet of to learn about these things. And this Saul of Tarsus, 
He excelled exceptionally above many of his own contemporaries, he'll say, in the law and the traditions, Galatians 1, verses 13 and 14. And so when we think about this man, he was a man steeped in the rich history of Israel. He loved the law of God. He wanted to stay true to those traditions. He was trying uh, honestly with a good conscience to follow that law. But we are now first introduced to Saul first mention of Saul by name in the Bible is in Acts chapter 7 verse number 58. I want you to listen to these words in Acts chapter 7 verse number 58. Where do we first learn about Saul of Tarsus? At the stoning of Stephen we learn this. Verse 58 says, And they cast him, that's Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Here's Saul, a young man, and he's participating, even by holding their coats. Uh, and he's a witness to, as the old law thought, they were living by, let everything be done at the mouth of two or three witnesses. And so he's a witness. He's holding their coats. He's watching them murder this man, and no doubt consenting to his death as well. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 following. You know, when we think about Saul, he was zealous for what he believed in. Saul, if there's one thing you could say is a constant about Saul who became Paul, he was always zealous in what he believed in. Paul, or Saul, zealously persecuted the church. Acts chapter 8, you'll notice these words beginning in verse number 1. Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. At that time a great persecution arose against the church. Look in verse 3. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, and committing them to prison. You look in Acts chapter 9, right before Jesus confronts him, he has letters of approval from the synagogue that if he finds any of the way, he can bind them and put them in prison. He was zealous for what he believed in. And friend, what made Saul such a great candidate when he learned the truth was that same zeal now that he's got truth. Is going to make Saul a powerful worker for the cause of Christ and the cause of God. Friend, if there's one thing God wants of us, it's for us to be zealous for good works. Titus 3 verses 14 following, to have that, that zeal combined with knowledge and really be active and, and aggressive in the cause of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how is it that Saul, the persecutor, is changed? to Paul the Apostle. I want to direct your attention to Acts chapter 9 and let's begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly... A light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city. You'll be told you, it'll be told you what you must do do. How is it that Saul made this great change in his life? Here he is and he's breathing threats. He's, he's threatening people. He says, if we find you and your family who are of the way, you can be put to death. And so he's dragging men and women out of their houses. He's putting them in prison. Children are left without parents. He's doing great harm to the church. Does he think it's right? You bet he does. Acts 23, 1, Saul said, or Paul said, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And so Paul thinks he's doing the right thing. He's actively trying to do right. Jesus confronts him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I don't even know who you are. What do you mean, why am I persecuting you? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Saul now begins through this message from God to realize He's not been doing right. To realize the very way that he is doing harm to is the very way God wants him to go. And so God spoke directly to Saul. Saul recognized that as God. God, what do you want me to do? He didn't argue. He didn't complain. He said, Lord, 
what would you have me to do? Go in the city. It'll be told you what you must do. Friend, here you get an insight into the heart of God, heart of Saul. Did Saul, no matter what, want to please God? Absolutely. How do we know that? Saul went from persecuting the church, dragging men and women, women in prison, likely helping in the killing of Christians we know, to being the very one who is now on that side of the field. Saul is going to be persecuted. Saul is going to be stoned. Saul, his life is going to be uh, on the line now and he's going to be preaching the gospel. His conversion shows he had the right heart. And so what did Saul do? He heard Christ and he believed in Him. The Bible says to become a Christian one must hear the Word of God and believe in Jesus. Romans 10 verse 17, John 8 verse 24. Was Saul willing to, willing to change his way? You bet he was. Jesus told him, you're going down the wrong path. Here's what I want you to do. And Saul spent great time in prayer. Acts chapter 9 verses 11 through 12. And so no doubt he had an attitude of repentance and wanting to do the right thing. But was Saul saved at the point of belief? Was Saul saved when he repented? Was Saul saved when he prayed those three days? No, he wasn't saved by belief alone. He wasn't saved by praying. He wasn't saved at the point that he just recognized. At what point was Saul saved? Well, let's let the Bible tell us. Notice Acts chapter 22. We now get the rest of the story. God sends one of His servants, a man by the name of Ananias, to Saul of Tarsus, who's been there in that house, waiting for God to come. You remember God said, you go here and be told you what you must do. Here is that must. Look in Acts 22, verse 16. Ananias comes to Saul and says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, listen very carefully. There's no doubt Saul believed in Jesus. There's no doubt he prayed and he realized he was a sinner. There's no doubt that he was willing to change his life and repent. But the question I would ask you is this. At what point in the Bible does it say Saul had his sins forgiven? Arise, listen carefully now, and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, we want to say what the Bible says. We want to say it in love, but I hope you'll listen real carefully. There are a lot of people who will teach. All you've got to do to be saved is believe. There are a lot of people who will say, just say the sinner's prayer and you can be saved. You can find a sinner's prayer in the Bible. Where's that at? But here's what we do know. When Saul had his sins forgiven, it was at the very point of baptism. Now listen carefully. If it's sin that separates me from God, if it's sin that separates you from God, and it is, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, and if all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23, then friend, whatever moment in time my sins are washed away, I'm made right with God. When is that? Listen again. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, here's another question we want to let the Bible answer. Oftentimes, I will hear people say, and they'll quote passages like Acts 2, verses 19 through 21, that will say, uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friend, there's no denying that's in the Bible. That's true. We agree with that 100% as the Scriptures teach that. But the question remains, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? I hear people say, all you do is call the name of the Lord, and by that, they mean this. If you will say this prayer, Dear Lord Jesus, we recognize you as Savior. We accept you in our heart. Come now and save us. That's what they mean by calling on, on the name of the Lord. Is that what the Bible teaches? Well, friend, we've already said you don't find that prayer in the Bible. What does the Scripture mean when it says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved? Acts twenty two sixteen is God's divine commentary. Listen to it again. Ananias comes to Saul and he says, Why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. Don't miss this. Calling on the Lord's name. How do you call on the name of the Lord? By getting up and doing what God says to be saved. Does that include baptism? It absolutely does. Do you find a sinner's prayer in there? No, you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. And so, friend, as we think about this principle, let's let the Bible be its own best commentary. When God says, Call on the name of the Lord, I want to know what the Bible means by that. Acts 22, 16 tells us. Now, another thing we want to mention, and this is such an important principle as it relates to the need not to procrastinate. 
Saul was asked a great question. And friend, we're asking that same question today. If one has never obeyed the gospel, here's the question. Why are you waiting? Those were Saul's, those were Ananias' words to Saul. Why are you waiting? And we ask that today. If one has never become a Christian, why are you waiting? God's done everything possible. He sent His Son to die for me and you. John 3, 16. He's made that great invitation. Whosoever will, let him come drink freely. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. There is a great reward to be offered. If we remain faithful unto death, we can have the crown of life. And so, friend, we ask with all seriousness, if you've never become a Christian, just as Ananias asked Saul, we're asking you today, why are you waiting? And so consider seriously the need to obey the gospel and become a Christian, become a child of God. Let's now direct our attention to some great lessons that we can learn from Paul's life. What was Paul's commission? Paul had a commission and he faithfully followed that. Acts 26 verses 16 through 18, God said He was going to send him to Gentiles, kings, peoples, nations to preach the gospel far and wide. And did Paul do that? You bet he did. All the way to Rome itself. To, he went to Caesar himself with the gospel. In fact, at the end of Acts, you have recorded some of Caesar's household had even heard the gospel. And so when we think about Saul and his commission, he had a commission. He fulfilled that faithfully. Let's make application. Do Christians have a commission today? Do we have a mission? You bet we do. We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Friend, let's take our mission, our commission, just as seriously as Saul did. Where does that world start? Right next door, at work, with your friends and family, with your neighbors, with the people that we come in contact with. Are we saying you can force them or you've got to make them? That's not what we're saying. Friend, please listen carefully. Baptism is not our work. Baptism is a fruit of the work. What is the work? My mission and your commission is to preach the gospel. Baptism is what happens when good hearts hear that gospel and obey it. Let's not gear that off of, okay, we've got to baptize so many people. That's not what we're saying. My job is simply to preach the word. God will give the increase, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 6. What else do we know about Saul of Tarsus who became Paul? Saul and Paul, or Paul, was indeed a hard worker in the cause of Christ. Look at what he did. Think about this. You hear about the three evangelistic journeys of Saul. Have you ever thought about how much distance Saul covered? If you took from point A to point B in a straight line, and Paul didn't go in a straight line, but if you took all those three journeys and took a straight line on a map, did you know that would be 13,000 miles traveling for the gospel as the crow flies? And Paul didn't go as the crow flies. 13,000 miles before the invention of the car, before the invention of modern transportation today. You remember, he was often uh, in the deep, shipwrecked, faced a lot of troubles. Paul was a hard worker for the cause of Christ. Friend, as I think about my life and as you think about yours, what is it God wants of me and you? Here's what He wants. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Jesus said, We've got to work the works of Him who sent us while it is day. Night comes when no man works. Now's the time. Now's the opportunity. opportunity. Let's be working diligently and hard workers in the cause of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What other practical lessons can we learn from Paul? Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul would say in Romans 1 verses 14 through 16, I'm indebted to preach the gospel. I'm ready to preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed to preach the gospel. You know, there's a, a threefold way of thinking about our relationship to the gospel. I am indebted to preach the gospel. Do you feel, if you're a child of God, do you feel a certain sense of indebtedness? By that we mean, do you recognize what God did for you? Do you appreciate the great sacrifice that was made? And, and do you, in some small way, want to do your best to honor that sacrifice? There's a sense of indebtedness. I'm indebted to preach the gospel. Are you ready to preach the gospel? 1 Peter 3 verse 15 says, 
Be ready always. To be ready, you've got to get ready. Have we been studying? Have we been preparing? Have we been thinking about? And are we looking for opportunities? And then, thirdly, I'm not ashamed. Are we sometimes ashamed of the gospel? Friends, shame on us if we are ashamed to tell others about the gospel. It's the good news. It's the hope of salvation. It's what makes life worth living. It's what helps us to lay down at night and sleep knowing that all is well. Wouldn't you want somebody else to have good news and hope? Don't ever be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the good news unto salvation. Paul also from his life we learn that he made a lot of changes and the things he was in the past he didn't let those things shape who he would be in the future and how he would live his life i want to direct your attention to philippians chapter 3 and i want you to notice what things paul had to give up for the gospel of christ look in philippians chapter 3 beginning in verse number 4. paul said though i also might have confidence in the flesh if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. What do you mean, Paul? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Yet, yes, indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Did Paul have to give up to gain Christ? You bet he did. Here's a practical lesson. Whatever you were, and whatever I was, before we came to Christ, I will assure you, is worth giving up and never looking back. Could Paul have been something in the Hebrew nation? He already was. And he was destined to become more, no doubt. Chief of the stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, taught at the feet of Gamaliel, zealous, righteous, blameless. I mean, he, was the, he had the top pedigree in Israel. Did it cost him to give that up? Oh, you bet it did. Ultimately, it's going to cost him his life for the cause of Christ. But was it worth it? Absolutely it was. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 15, the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and rose again. Paul sacrificed. He gave up to gain Christ. How did he look at all that in the past? He didn't look back. He said, it's all garbage compared to what I've gained. Friend, all of us have had to come out of something to become a Christian. Whether that was worldliness, maybe you had to give up things in the world. Maybe you had to give up lust and passion and, and pleasure and friends and things, or maybe a job even. Maybe you've come out of denominational error and that there's been some cost and sacrifice involved in that. Friend, rest assured, just as with Paul, it is the same with us. Whatever we've given up can't begin to compare with what we'll receive. Listen to Romans 8:18. I consider the sufferings of this present day are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when I think about Saul and who later became Paul, we think about his humility as a practical lesson. In Ephesians 3 verse 8, Paul said, He considered himself the least of all the saints. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, Paul said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How did Paul view himself? Least of all the saints. How did he look at himself? Chief of sinners. Friend, there's a sense of humility, honesty, owning up to his own sin and his own deeds. And when we think about our life, let's not, let's not think we're better than we are. Let's not put ourselves on a pedestal and look down to others. Let's realize all men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. Let's realize we needed the blood of Jesus just as much as the next person. Jesus tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2, verse number 9. And so from Saul we learn to have humility. Uh, whoever humbles himself 
He's the one God is pleased with. Let us humble ourselves in the mighty hand of God that He might exalt us in due time. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 8. And so as we think about Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, what a great man of God who really shows us the, the need to do what's right and live according to the truth of God. Friend, we want to ask you to consider seriously today from Saul, who later became Paul, the need to change in one's life and become a Christian. If you've never obeyed the gospel, maybe you've got the zeal, maybe you've got the passion, maybe you've got the desire of Saul. We hope today that you can combine that desire and passion and zeal with understanding what God wants you to do to become a Christian. Maybe you have to come out of something. That's okay. Saul had to leave a lot behind too, but what he gained was worth it. And so let's ask the question of the hour. Let's ask this question. What does a person need to do? Just like Saul of Tarsus, what does a person need to do to become a Christian? Friend, it's not hard. It's not complicated. It, it doesn't take looking to religious leaders of today's day to figure it out. It's right here in the Bible. The Bible says you've got to hear the Word of God. That voice came to Saul. He said, Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. He had to hear the voice of Christ. I hear the voice of Jesus today in the Bible. God has spoken to us in these last days through His Son, and that's recorded in the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Then, once I've heard the message about Christ, I've got to be convicted and committed to it and believe it. I must believe. Acts chapter 8, as Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road, he sees water in the distance. Here's water, what hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Are you willing to do what Saul did, change? Will you turn from whatever in life you need to turn from? Leave behind what you need to leave behind and turn to God. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Would you confess Jesus as Christ? Paul did. Who are, I'm Jesus who refused. Lord, what would you have me to do? He recognized Jesus as Lord. In Acts chapter 8, we see the Ethiopian eunuch doing the same thing. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, friend, would you do what Peter told them to do on the very first gospel sermon? They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was this, Repent and be baptized, listen now, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 verse 38. And so, whatever you've got to give up, whatever you've got to leave behind, whatever you've got to do to become a Christian, I'll assure you, it's worth it. Saul stands out as a man who made a 180 degree turn from sin, from selfishness to God, and he had hope. Friend, our hope and prayer today is that you'll obey the gospel and you also can have that hope. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.